doesn't get any better than this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Inside College Basketball, presented by Progressive Insurance. I'm Greg Gumbel. News broke yesterday that dozens of current or former NCAA basketball players were accused of receiving payments and other benefits from former sports agents. The Yahoo Sports report detailed allegations found in documents obtained in the ongoing federal investigation into corruption in the sport. Those benefits ranging from meals to thousands of dollars in payments represent potential NCAA violations for programs such as defending national champion North Carolina, perennial contenders Duke, Michigan State, and Kansas, and more than a dozen other programs in contention for an NCAA tournament berth this season. With me now, my colleagues Clark Kellogg and Seth Davis, we are joined by the president of the NCAA, Dr. Mark Emmert. Mark, there are people who see a hornet's nest ahead of them, and some walk around it, and apparently you've decided to just walk right through it, and we're, <laughs> we're glad that you're here. Um, well, thank you. What, what was your reaction? To the reactions cover the entire landscape. People are saying that this can't be happening. There are others at the other end of the spectrum saying that we've known it for years or there have been signs of it for years. Where did you come down on this? Well, I think in, in both of those places, you know, there's been constant rumors and occasional cases that pop up where we've seen agent behavior and coaches behavior that's uh, as egregious as this one. We've just never seen it collectively. You know, nobody in, in college sports has wiretap authority or subpoena authority or the ability to do undercover agents like the FBI does. So they were able to get into these uh, these cases and, and uncover information that no one's seen before. You know, the report specifically named dozens of players connected to dollar amounts and payments and other benefits. How does that affect the eligibility of those players the rest of the season and, and maybe into the tournament. Yeah, so uh, in the in the information that came out yesterday, which is still in a news report, it hasn't been validated by anybody, uh, but let's assume for the time being that it's all good information. Uh, there's about six or seven current student athletes that have uh, allegedly been involved with something from taking a meal with an agent on the way up, all the way up to a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, what The way the process works right now is that under normal circumstances, the school would look at that information, declare whether or not, talk to the student, talk to family members, de declare whether or not the student's eligible or ineligible. If they determine he's ineligible, they'll have him sit, or out of abundance of caution, they'll have him sit again. Contact my people right away, and then my people will look at the facts and say, okay, he's, he's fine to play, or he needs to sit a game, or whatever the circumstances are for that particular case. Uh, we're doing that right now as we speak with all of these schools that have been named with current players, trying to work through it as rapidly as possible. Uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased with the progress that we're making on such short notice, and hopefully it won't have uh, that big impact on the playing time of these individual players. Again, depends on the circumstances of any one case. Mark, all of us, and I think a lot of the public, is under the impression all these years that it is the NCAA's job to root out this information. So why is the FBI having to do your job for you? Yeah, so we're constantly looking for and trying to uncover this information, but you know the, the, the power of a federal investigatory team is uh, is something that uh, someone who's not in a governmental position can't begin to have. So the NCAA is a voluntary association of 1,100 schools. Nobody's granted us subpoena power or the ability to do wiretaps or uh, run undercover sting operations. So because they got tipped off over two years ago that some of these activities were going on, the criminal elements of it, they were able to go in and collect this information. We're trying really hard to get that information from the federal investigators on a regular basis. We're in contact with them through our respective attorneys on a pretty constant basis. Uh, they have to protect information for their investigation. We have to respect the boundaries of, of that investigation. Um, the, the information that came out the past 24 hours is not information, as far as we know, that came from the federal government. It came from some other source. We don't know exactly what that source was. Uh, so we're right now working with schools trying to determine the accuracy and veracity of those, uh, of those documents. You know, Dr. Emmer, for folks that are cynical about the NCAA, its structure and so forth, I know the, the, the concept of amateurism has evolved over decades. How would you define that concept right now from your perspective, the concept 
of amateurism. Yeah, I think, Clark, you, you're making an important point because that concept has evolved and constantly does. The, the rules, all the rules of the NCAA are made by the schools themselves through a complicated representative bureaucracy uh, that, that, that sits down and, and this representative governmental system sits and makes all the rules and they've evolved that definition uh, and, and likely will continue to. You know, the fundamental principle is that this is not about student athletes pay, playing a game to get paid. It's not about pay for play. It's about young men, young women playing these games while they are students mm -hmm. uh, at their universities. Uh, there are people that would like them to be paid a salary. There are people that don't think they should even be students. And, and the member universities uh, fundamentally say, no, 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 they're student athletes. They're students at their school. They're there to get an education while they advance their, their sport. And, and for those that can go on, a tiny portion can go on and play professional athletics, great for them. Uh, but first and foremost, they have got to be part of that university and not an employee of that university. And there would be some that would argue the concept and definition is antiquated. There have been concessions made. Is it time now to consider revamping that definition or concept of amateurism from the standpoint of perhaps what we see in hockey and baseball in terms of student athletes that may be potential pros having an opportunity to, to have relationships with agents in a different form or fashion? Yeah, I think, as you know, we uh, we put together, I and the Board of Governors of the NCA put together a commission that Condoleezza Rice is chairing mm -hmm. for us, asked them to identify uh, specific recommendations in a handful of areas, but none of those areas is new. We've been talking about them, working on them, trying to generate consensus among the schools for years now. One of them is certainly agents. Mm -hmm. And what should the relationship be between students, current student athletes, and even, even high school student athletes? And, and, and uh, uh, we, we allow, the rules now allow more contact and more interaction with baseball and hockey athletes because of the nature of their draft than we do with, with college basketball. And, and that's something that we're going to be talking a lot about. And we'll see, I, I suspect, a bunch of recommendations between now and and this spring coming forward to revisit that. It, it makes perfect sense to me that it, it ought to be very different than it is right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mark, I know that we all sit here and, and, and none of us would dare think, well, now that these revelations are out in the open, good, that's the end of it. There's probably a lot more than that. How do you go about finding that out? How do you go about searching all of that? Yeah, first and foremost, we're going to, as I said, stay in close contact with the federal investigation. They have They have tools for doing investigations that... Uh, no one else has, and and try and learn everything we can from that, from the trial processes that are coming forward. We have actually a, a really robust investigation operation of our own. We'll continue doing that and trying to understand what has happened, working with the schools and and uh, the coaching community and with um, with all the administrators, as well as with the students and their families. Yeah. Did you think that maybe your investigators might have come across this stuff? Uh, or yeah, you, don't, you don't get into the wiretapping business, though. <laughs> we, we don't get into the wiretapping business or the search or subpoena business. You know, we can't force somebody who's not an employee of a university to testify. You know, you, it, we, we have no ability to make an agent, for example, show us their records or or uh, give us any specific information. We can only work with people who are in the higher education system themselves. Did, did we or anybody else have suspicions that these things are going on? Well, of course, everybody did. No one was shocked that these things occurred. The magnitude of them, I think, is, is surprising to a lot of folks. Uh, what's most disappointing to me is those uh, are those activities that strike at the fundamental issues of integrity. When you see an agent providing money to a coach to conduct a transaction with or without the knowledge of a student, well, that's pretty despicable stuff. Um, that's the stuff that we've got to root out of this and 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 deal with in a completely different fashion. You know, a, a student athlete having dinner with a with a uh, a potential agent, that's not even against the rules. The only thing that might be against the rule is if the agent picked up the meal. That's a de minimis kind of issue. That's not something anybody's going to get wound up about. It's when the adults and the people that are supposed to be the professionals in this activity, when they have engaged in egregious actions, that's the stuff that's got to get fixed. So, Mark, the big news of the day this morning is the report, uh, speaking of wiretaps, that Sean Miller uh, was reportedly heard on FBI wiretap talking about handling a transaction, $100,000 to his freshman, uh, DeAndre Ayton. They play tonight at Oregon. Uh, what?
type of uh, guidance or advice would you give Arizona about having to decide whether Sean Miller and DeAndre Aiden can participate not only tonight, but moving forward for that team? Sure. Well, first and foremost, again, that's a decision the school has to make. We don't reach in and tell a, a school that a coach can or can't play tonight um, unless there's an open investigation going on that's already been through a whole process. There's been no process here. Uh, we've got a, a report in the media. A, a, again, I'll let everybody make their own determinations about the credibility of that. But the school will have to say, look, we're, we're not going to uh, have the coach play tonight or coach tonight, and we're, and we're going to sit this, this young man tonight. Uh, we've already seen some schools make those judgment calls uh, today. There'll doubtlessly be some more as time goes on. Then they can come back to us either today or tomorrow and say, look, we think that that this behavior constitutes a one-game sit for this student. Um, you mentioned you've been in contact with the other schools. Have you guys been in contact with Arizona yet? Uh, I, we've been in touch with every school that has a, a current student athlete involved. Okay, we'll take a time out here. We have much more to talk with Dr. Emmert about, and we will continue that here on CBS after this. Inside College Basketball, presented by Progressive Insurance, is sponsored by Progressive Insurance, your first-round pick for car insurance. And by American Cancer Society. Fight cancer by texting CBC to 20222. Next on CBS, it is Louisville at Virginia Tech in an ACC showdown. We welcome you back inside Studio 43 along with Clark Kellogg, Seth Davis, and the president of the NCAA, Dr. Mark Emmert. I'm Greg Dumble. As we continue with our conversation earlier this week on Tuesday, the NCAA denied Louisville's appeal of the penalties levied against that school. Louisville's current troubles extend back to October of 2015 when the university learned of possible violations leading to a joint investigation with the NCAA. The following spring, the school took proactive measures, including self-imposing a postseason ban. Fifteen months later, the NCAA handed down its initial ruling, which the university appealed. Then, this fall, after a connection to the FBI's current investigation, the university fired both Rick Pitino and athletic director Tom Jurich. And on Tuesday, the NCAA upheld its ruling requiring Louisville to vacate 123 games between the 2010 and 2014 seasons, including two Final Four appearances and its 2013 National Championship. Those punishments have been deemed by some to be draconian and unjust. Are they draconian? Are they unjust? Well, first of all, let's, let's make clear that, that who, the, the people who actually make these judgments, who actually um, determine what a penalty will be in any one case, are representatives of the universities themselves. So it's not a staff member sitting in a dark room making these decisions. It's, it's university representatives coming together saying, here's how we want to hold each other accountable. And so those bodies reach a conclusion that all of the allegations in that particular case were true, and, and therefore that there were athletes who played in those contests who, were, who should have been determined to be ineligible, and therefore they had players on the, on the floor who should, shouldn't have been participants, and they determined that, that that meant that those games had to be stricken from the rule book. I, I certainly understand why uh, fans and supporters of the university would think that's draconian. Uh, the Committee on Infractions and the Appeals Committee disagreed. Mark, to Greg's original question about your degree of surprise, having been on this beat for 20 some odd years, I don't think there are a lot of people who are surprised that this type of activity is going on with agents. I've often said that agents are to college basketball what steroids have been to baseball, yet it took a federal case for there to be a commission to be named for people to talk about real reform in the agent areas. How did we get here where it takes that type of case to uh, create this discussion? Yeah, I think it's a really important question for us going forward, Seth, you know, because we've got to make sure that we don't find ourselves in this box again. You know, the rules of the association have accumulated over years, and there's, there's no doubt in my mind, and I think in most of the member universities' minds, that some of those rules have simply been written for a different age. 
Now, they, while there has doubtlessly been agent activity and, and these kinds of things that we're seeing in the past, uh, I suspect, and most people do, that this has reached a crescendo now because there's so much attention on it now. There's so many resources involved. There's a lot of money, obviously, in circulation right now around, around all these events that that's, that's caused a, a severe uptick. And we need to go in and look at the rules and say, OK, how do we make this fit and work for the current context going forward, not for the current context going backwards. And that's what our reform effort's all about. And, and while nobody wants to hear words, they want to see action. I get that as much as anyone. Uh, we got to get on with that. And, we, and we're really serious about it. I and the board of directors are very, very serious about making really systemic change uh, starting this spring and going forward through the summer. And on the heels of that, you appointed the Commission on College Basketball being headed by Condoleezza Rice, some other noteworthy, intelligent folks that have an interest in seeing this get cleaned up. How do, what's your expectation from that committee? And then also, how do we begin that long process of getting it cleaned up? Yeah, the expectation is really clear. They're, they've been given a, a, a mission to look at five areas. I won't talk about them today, but five discrete areas in college basketball that are at the core of all the things we're looking at here. Uh, I sit on that commission as an ex officio member. The commission is very independent. They're doing their own work. They're interviewing and talking to all the people that you'd want them to talk to. They're, they're now going to um, be putting together their recommendations, bring them forward in the spring during the month of April. Uh, and then the, the boards are going to act on them and act on them quickly. Um, I've said in, in lots of public forums that they need to have these things done and we need to act and have changes in place before tip off of next season. I think a failure to do that uh, really will erode everybody's confidence in what this uh, wonderful game is all about. Mm -hmm. Mark, there's been some pretty significant fallout at Michigan State University in the wake of the sentencing of a former team physician, uh, Larry Nasser, after years of sexual abuse of hundreds of young women under the guise of medical care. What's the status of the NCAA's investigation into the university for its handling of complaints? Well, we never we never comment on any ongoing investigations, but it, you know, in the case of Michigan State, you've got a variety of investigations going on outside of the NCA, including by the Attorney General of the, of the country of the state of, of Michigan. And, and so we'll we'll wait and see what the outcome is from there before we take any steps forward. Again, we've got to respect the boundaries of other of other enforcement entities that are involved in investigations. Okay. We're the broadcasters and there are millions and millions of college basketball fans. How are we supposed to approach the selection process coming up for the for the tournament? How do we approach the tournament? What are we to think of this sport now with all of these things that have come up? Well, first of all, I, I think that by the time we get to Selection Sunday, we'll have a much better handle on what's going on with the current students so that we, we have eligibility solutions, I hope, in place for those who are and aren't eligible. And, and everybody in the selection committee and the fans out there will know what's really going on. Uh, the vast majority of the coaches, and <clears throat> I believe this deeply, the vast majority of the coaches in the sport are behaving themselves and conducting themselves appropriately, as are the vast majority of student athletes. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so we need, to, we need to recognize them for what they're doing and what their commitment is and enjoy these great games. Uh, if there have to be investigations because of the information that's going to come out over the next uh, 24 months or so because of the federal investigations, then we're going to pursue them. We're going to pursue them aggressively. Uh, after the season's over, then we're going to go in and, and make changes to the nature of the rules and, and move forward. But we are going to hold, us, especially the adults, we're going to hold them accountable for their behavior. Anything else you want to let us know before we let you go? No, I think that's plenty for you. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you being here. Nobody, nobody envies you your job, but you've got a big one ahead of you. Well, thanks for inviting me here. I appreciate talking with you guys. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Mark Emery, we'll take a break here. When we come back, our college basketball insider, John Rothstein, joins us. Continue the conversation after this. EBR majors. Eight seconds can mean an entire legacy at this year's Iron Cowboy. Tonight at 1030 on CBS Sports Network. Defending national champions. Oh my goodness! For the win! Major Huggies! We are 
just about two weeks away now from 2018 NCAA March Madness Selection Show live from Atlanta, where Ernie Johnson, Charles Barkley, Kenny Smith will join us for the exclusive announcement of the pairings of the Ben's NCAA Tournament Bracket. A two-hour special comes your way March 11th, 6 p.m. Eastern Time on TBS. Joining us now is our college basketball insider, John Rothstein, as we continue with our conversation on the allegations and ongoing investigation. Uh, what do you think? How's this investigation is going to affect the NCAA selection committee come selection Sunday? Well, it depends, obviously, who's eligible for the NCAA tournament. Now, we have seen so far today several schools come out and announce that certain players that were named in that report, USC's Chemezi Metu, Kentucky's Kevin Knox, will play in their respective games today. So that's the biggest thing for me. How will those programs, now will those schools respond to the players who are currently playing college basketball who were in that report? Does that surprise you guys? No, not really, because the institutions have the ability to evaluate what's true, what's not, and then make a decision as to the eligibility of their individual players. I'm actually quite confident and hopeful. It's going to take some time now. We've got a messy, broken system. There's no, no denying that. Fix. No quick fix, but I think the Commission on Basketball is going to come up with some recommendations. And you can see the appetite and the desire for change yep. is really there, I think. And sometimes it takes these kinds of issues ashes and fire and burning and clouds to move people to a place where they're ready for meaningful change. And I think we're headed there. I'm actually hopeful and confident that we are. I, I agree with you, Clark, but it shouldn't take this. No, I, I, mean, I this understand, but sometimes it Everybody does. knows yeah. that this has been going on, particularly with respect to agents. And it's really the uh, emergence of the summertime AAU circuit where it just became open season for agents and sneaker companies and these types of deals to be made. I mean, everybody knows this this has been going on. These revelations coming from one agent, and I hasten to add that let's separate the uh, transactions with the agents and what we're talking about with Sean Miller. We're talking about a head coach at a major Division I school on a wiretap talking about moving $100,000. I find it hard to believe that Sean Miller can continue to coach uh, for this team tonight and, and down the road. And I, I'm sad that it took this type of situation to create change, but I'm hopeful that change is going to happen. Now, Arizona has to put Sean Miller on administrative leave to confirm what was noted in that report, and it also needs to suspend DeAndre Ayton indefinitely to confirm what was in that report because this is not about Arizona basketball anymore. That's right. This is about the integrity of that university. And you're right. Agents have been part of college basketball. And I can tell you this. When I started this business, somebody said, you want to cover college basketball? You need to understand the world within the world. Recruiting by agents to secure lottery picks is much more ruthless than it is for college coaches to secure five-star recruits. Mm -hmm. And I think right now, when you look at what's going on at Arizona, that was one thing that was definitely reiterated. Dr. Emmert says that right now that's an Arizona issue. Should Sean Miller coach tonight? No, absolutely not. Administrative leave for Arizona to confirm what was in that report, and DeAndre Ayton has to be held out of a competition indefinitely. I say, did all that. That's yeah. clearly, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a line you don't cross. There's been a real absence of leadership in college basketball. The NCAA president is a really fancy-sounding title. Mark Emmert has very little power for change. College basketball needs a CEO or a commissioner to push these changes through and speed up the yeah. pace of progress because they are woefully behind the times. All right, guys, we'll be back with more in a moment. You're watching Inside College Basketball, presented by Progressive Insurance on CBS. Get the CBS Sports app to watch live college basketball every weekend, whether you're at home or on the road. Inside College Basketball, presented by Progressive Insurance, is sponsored by Progressive Insurance, your first round pick for car insurance. And by Jersey Mike's Subs. Be a sub above. As we move from basketball off the court to back on the court, Louisville, Virginia Tech coming up in just a moment. What about this game? Well, this Virginia Tech team is balanced, multiple scores, love to get in the paint and shoot threes. I like the Hokies at home over the Cardinal. First one to 90 wins this one. This is going to be up-tempo basketball, small ball versus the big boys. Brad Nessler <laughs> and Jim Spinarkle standing by. That'll do it for us for now. We will see you back here at the half. Up next, Louisville and Virginia Tech here on CBS after this message and a word from your local station. The PGA Tour heads to the Sunshine State to Jack Nicklaus's Bear Trap and the Honda Classic. Full coverage later today on CBS.